بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاسالوا اهل الذكر ان كنتم لا تعلمون صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين i begin with thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the almighty for this opportunity alhamdulillah today marks a day inshallah in the history of iqra bangla uh, today uh, in the islamic q and a we have ourselves alhamdulillah coming to iqra bangla uh, after alhamdulillah many persuasions and uh, many requests alhamdulillah we are honored to have our honorable guest here with us today just a little introduction he is a graduate of darul ulum berry uh, alhamdulillah since he's graduated he's some of, one of some of the early generation graduates may i say uh, and mashallah since he's graduated uh, the many khidmat he has done around the world not just in england uh, uh, and in america i believe inshallah we will get to know more about that uh, he is famously known for the white thread institute as well as white thread press and zamzam academy uh, all of which uh, are all alhamdulillah his foundings and his khidmat uh, more so more than just lectures and bayans and education he is also a teacher of hadith a teacher to the post graduation ulama uh, and also mashallah uh, a writer many many alhamdulillah of different different fields uh, have benefited from one of his latest uh, books is the healthy muslim marriage i introduce to our community i introduce to iqra bangla our honorable guest hazratul allam dr mufti abdul rahman ibn yusuf mangera assalamu alaikum mufti sahab wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh mufti sahab a heartfelt welcome to uh, our community our tv uh, especially iqra bangla in the heart of east london uh, i hope that inshallah today is the beginning of many many Uh, nights of islamic discussions and uh, uh, questions and answers where in by which inshallah many many people should benefit inshallah, inshallah allah taala help us ameen inshallah. ameen alhamdulillah mufti sahab um, little bit about yourself for our viewers inshallah so today's islamic q and a uh, this program is generally the viewers call in they'll ask questions inshallah i'll take those questions and then when we have a few questions i'll ask them to you inshallah and you can ask them as you will inshallah so while we're waiting for our viewers uh, beloved viewers inshallah call in as it mufti sahab is available uh, our young brothers and sisters whatever questions you have regarding islam any issues that you have that you want uh, uh, a qualified alim to solve inshallah that mufti sahab is here with us uh, in the meantime just for our viewers to get to know you a little bit better this is correct right you are graduate of uh, darul ulum berry that's right yeah i finished in about 1997 1997 subhanallah yeah. early 1997 now sounds like a long time ago but it's <laughs> actually yeah it wasn't too long ago it wasn't too long yeah, ago yes uh, and uh, how was the experience in dalumberi i mean i thoroughly enjoyed it i never since i entered when i was uh, in 1985 when i was i think 11 and a half and then when i left i was 22 so pretty much i'd spent half of my life there wow. and while i did feel homesick when i first went there i never felt like going home because it was quite enjoyable mashallah and of course you know when you have a zeal uh, and a interest in what you're seeking and mashallah uh, the teachers were wonderful of course you see they was very strict yes. uh, strict meaning uh, i mean there's other places where probably more strict but alhamdulillah with our sheikh hazrat mawlana yusuf mutala sahab he just made it really a good experience the, the environment was just amazing alhamdulillah 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 and after that mufti sahab you you pursued uh, obviously you pursued your iftar and then your doctorate as well 
Where, where were those? Yeah, so what happened is that after I graduated um, from Darulum Berry, you know, and you do the Dawratul Hadith, the Bukhari, and then I decided I needed to study more, but then I ended up getting married literally a month after graduation. And then a month after that, we uh, took off to South Africa where I did the Mufti course first with our Sheikh Mufti Radha al Haqsab. And I also did a BA honors degree there uh, at the Rand Afrikaans University, which is now the University of Johannesburg. Uh, when that was finished, then I went to, came back home and then I went to Syria to study there. Uh, these were in the good old days in Syria before all of these problems yes, have yes. occurred there. That was in 98. And then in 1999, I went, I didn't feel competent enough. I still don't. But I went to do the Mufti course again in uh, Saharanpur in UP in India, which okay. is one of our traditional places. Um, the second madrasa after Dalun Deuban was established. Sure. So I did the Mufti course again there, and then I finished. And uh, thereafter that, I from there I came back home, and then I went to America for an imamat uh, position to California. Stayed there for eight years, and then came back because my mother was sick and ill. Rahimahullah. <laughs> Uh, and then after that, in the next year, I started my master's and PhD at SOAS, and that was finished in 2013, alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. What a journey, mashallah. Um, obviously, you've wrapped it up very, mashallah, very swiftly, very quickly. Um, but those were times, mashallah, where um, these, are, these are things that uh, make a person who they are. And in, that, in those times, mashallah, the khidmat that you gave, the service that you gave, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted and obviously it is accepted in the community Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us, grant us this opportunity to take from you inshallah um, so um, moving on from uh, so Syria you said um, Syria how, how was the uh, learning in Syria? I mean, well, Syria was mashallah Syria was just amazing the ulama and the light there was amazing the, the light the nur as you call it mm -hmm. I still remember the first time I, we landed there it was in the middle of the night because in those countries um, uh, planes come and go at night time as well. In England, there's, you, you don't get any flights after 12 o'clock, I think, until like 5 o'clock in the morning. And we were going from the airport, took a taxi, I think, and we were going to the place that we had rented and somebody had helped us out. And mashallah, because it was getting closer to Fajr time, you could actually already hear certain they, they do certain praises of the Prophet Sallallahu and other things before that. It was just very calm. Uh, in Syria at that time, I don't know now, but in Syria at that time there was no mobile phones. Mm. Next door in Lebanon there were, but not in Syria. There was no Coca Cola. There were no there were no foreign brands. There was no Coca Cola. You could buy some foreign brands at street corners of smuggled things in from Jordan or from Lebanon, but there was there were no chain there were there were hardly any chain uh, chains down there. Uh, Western franchise owning mm -hmm. and mashallah, uh, you know, we're used to this uh, Unlike other countries there there were a lot of durus in different masjids mashallah. So there were Sheikh Ramadan al Buti was there Sheikh Wahba Zuhaili Number of other scholars and you know my Sheikh Sheikh Abdul Razak al Halabi rahimahullah and Sheikh Adib Kallas rahimahullah and The one amazing thing that I learned from there was that when even ulama when they graduate from their courses They don't stop learning they go to the bigger sheikhs once a week, twice a week, and then they carry on studying. So there was one sheikh, we'd go to Sheikh Adib Kallas, and literally there would be 40, 50 year old shuyukh coming to study with him, and he was probably about 65, 70 by that time. Right? So there's an amazing tradition of that, mashallah. And, you know, Damascus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has made dua for Sham Allahumma barik lana fi shamina mm. So there's this amazing softness there People are very soft and laid back And religious, mashallah Masha There's a lot of piety and religiosity there And then the Jamia al-Umawi Which is what, a 1300 year old uh, building uh, Originally made by Walid ibn Abdul Malik The same person who had the Qubba al-Sakhra made uh, son of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, one of the Umayyads. Amazing, massive masjid. That is the one where it didn't exist in the time of the Prophet. But the Prophet had already foretold that Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, is going to descend on the eastern minaret. So I used to go to that masjid six days a week to uh, study with Sheikh Abdul Razak al Halabi, who used to hold his classes there. 
in a room there. That's the same masjid that Imam Ghazali did a retreat in. Mm-hmm. And they say that Yahya Salam's head is there. Uh, th- th- there's a number of other um, great things about that area. It's a big masjid, mashallah. So, so yeah, that's an amazing... I wish I can go back. I've just not been able to go back after all of these problems. Inshallah, yeah. if Allah brings some, some peace and goodness there, Ameen. Ameen. inshallah, we'll go back. Inshallah. inshallah. Inshallah, definitely. So, I mean, this is one thing that I wanted to always... I've always heard of the great ulama of Syria. Uh, and we hope, inshallah, that, like you said, inshallah, the good times come back and we are able to benefit from them. Like Rasulullah, you know, prayed for these kind of people. And of course... The fiqh is there. Uh, sorry, that's in uh, Yemen. But uh, Syria is also a very blessed land. So from Syria, you said you went to... Uh, sorry, before Syria, you were in Af- Africa. South Africa. South yeah. Africa. How, how, was, how was that? Again, all of these are, mashallah, very unique experiences yes, yes. because it's so different from the UK exactly. and the West in general. I mean, Africa is kind of half Western, but it's also very African in that sense. It's in Africa, obviously. Mm-hmm. And while it's an absolutely beautiful country, I would say that if it wasn't for the crime, it'd probably be paradise on earth because Allah has given it amazing weather, amazing natural beauties. You've got waterfalls, you've got mountains, you've got oceans, you've got just... The fruits. SubhanAllah. The fruits are just absolutely amazing. MashaAllah. And the people are very nice. They are, yes. You know, a lot of them. But unfortunately, there's a crime problem, a massive crime problem. And it was so bad that um, if I went shopping to the supermarkets and we parked our car outside in the parking lot of the spa, the local spa. At that time there weren't many big malls or anything. Right? Now there are, mm-hmm. right? And then if I, when we came back out after the shopping, 20 minutes, half an hour, and the car was still there, we'd say, Alhamdulillah. Oh, That's how dangerous it was. You could get carjacked literally any time. Mm-hmm. Now I heard it be- become worse in the sense that people are getting kidnapped now for ransoms. Mm-hmm. It's getting worse. Allah, Allah, Allah preserved the people there because Amen. it's an amazing people. But yeah, so uh, I managed to do university there and study with the Shiyukh uh, Madrasa Zakaria, Mufti Radawul Haqsab, may Allah bless him abundantly. Amen. So that was uh, an amazing experience because as a student, if you look at any of our classical scholars, they hardly ever stayed in one place and studied, they always traveled. They always went to different places and took from different shiyukh. Yes. And you get a different perspective as well. Mm. And that's the beauty of it. That's why I feel extremely fortunate to have been able to do that. That Allah allowed me to do that. I mean, I was supposed to get married after 25. Mm. And do this three years of uh, postgraduate study after alim course. But then it just so happened that I got married early. And then I remember some people even told me, you can forget about studying after you graduate from Darlun Berry because now you have a wife. Mm. So you're not going to be able to do so. But Alhamdulillah, it, Allah bless my wife as well and, Ameen, Ameen. and her parents and everybody that she just stuck by it. And um, South Africa was dangerous, but it was very nice. We had a lot of good people that helped us. Allah bless them. Some of them have left this world. I pray that Allah reward them abundantly. Ameen, Ameen. Um, Syria was, Alhamdulillah, very safe and very nice. That was a very shorter stay. Hmm. But then after that, when we went to America, uh, India. Acha India, yes. India was the toughest of them all. Wow. You'd be surprised. I'd be surprised. I thought Africa. But there, there was no crime. Okay. But just in terms of the facilities and everything, the lights, the electricity would just go for 24 hours. Oh. And then hot. Yes. I mean, you, you see in Bangladesh yes, how hot yes. it is. And then the mosquitoes. And I had a child by then. He'd get sick and I'm studying. But you know what's the amazing thing is that where there's more difficulty, somehow there's more barakah. That's what I've noticed. Yeah. My most productive year, I would say. Absolutely most productive year in my entire 12, 13, 14, 15 years of study, 16, 17, 18 years of study, I would probably say, was in India. Subhanallah. Even with a child and the difficulty and amazing. Because time is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he just opens it up for you. So you get a lot more done. That's an amazing thing. I wish I still had that kind of barakah now. Mm-hmm. I'd be able to do a lot more, subhanAllah. Subhanallah. So yeah. that was India. And mashallah, we can see. I mean, I, I will come to this later, inshallah. But um, let's go to America then. America, was it for study reasons? or was No, no, it, that was that for was a job. Now finally, like, okay, let's go and do some work now uh-huh. and settle down. So I thought that, mashallah, England has many, many ulama. So America, I'd been there several times before in Ramadans for Taraweeh. So I kind of knew the situation. And I thought, you know what, this is a place where we can do some work. So I'd been planning that for a few years. So then, alhamdulillah, I got a place. Turned out to be a very nice small place in California, Santa Barbara. Extremely beautiful place on the beach. And about two hours from Los Angeles. 
So I stayed imam there for eight years. It was a really good place because it was a smaller place, so the demand, it wasn't as busy as bigger places. And it let me learn and grow and make mistakes, you know. And you're on the sidelines, so you're not in a big community where you make a mistake and it could be blown out of proportion or something. Yes. So it's a beautiful, <laughs> Allah bless the people of Santa Barbara. Um, yeah, so that was a really good experience. And that's a totally... America will give you a totally, America, although it's West and UK is the West, but America is a totally different ball game. America is very unique in the world. I don't think there's any other country like it, for good or bad. I mean, you know, um, I'm not saying it's all good. I'm actually glad I'm back, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in America on a number of fronts. Yes, there must yeah. be. So this, is, um, this has been your, um, your journey. Once again, I'll remind our viewers, as it moves this up, uh, Alhamdulillah, this is first time, inshallah, this is the beginning of many, many, inshallah, nights to come. Wednesday nights, inshallah, the Islamic Q&A will be held by Hazrat Mufti Saab, inshallah, as the honorable guest. So any viewers that do have questions, inshallah, do make your calls. And we are, inshallah, here to uh, uh, listen to your questions and inshallah, Hazrat Mufti Saab will answer as well. So Mufti Saab, now coming back to England, now that you've finished your um, uh, imamat in America, what, what was it that brought you back anyway? Was there a reason or was it just your decision? Well, th there were a few reasons. Number one, my mother became ill with cancer. Yes, you said this. And, the, and in America, the visa situation after 9-11 had become a lot more complicated, especially if you had become a prominent speaker or become known. Then there was, I, I would say that it was probably targeted hassling for sure. Ah. So then I was basically stuck in a bit of a limbo. I wasn't getting past the whole immigration thing. And if I, had st if I came out, then I couldn't go back because oh, I'd have to go back on a new visa, right? Mm. So, but then my mum's situation was deteriorating. So then I thought, we'll just make a decision. And we had a rejection of a certain, uh, what do you call it, immigration application as well. So we decided to come back. And now looking at it, actually, I think it's a great, an amazing decision that we made because for the children, it was, it's just been much better here. There's a lot more going on here, a much better environment. So it's okay when your children are young down there and a lot of people are struggling with their children, just like they're struggling here as yes, well. Yes. But I just think there's a lot more facilities here than you have um, in America. America is getting better in certain areas, but I think in England, alhamdulillah, we're far ahead in that regard. So then I came back and yeah, mashallah. So I'm glad I came back. Okay, once again, I will remind our viewers, um, if anyone does have any questions that you may be uh, wondering, I speak uh, Bangla, I'm to Bangla, inshallah, I'm your Shateasi, after I'm going to ask you a question, I'm going to ask you a question, inshallah, after I'm going to ask you a question, inshallah, I'll translate it and I'll ask Mufti Sab the question. If anyone has questions that uh, they're not able to Ask in English, you can ask in Bangla, inshallah, and I will translate it to Azad Mufti Saab, and he'll answer your questions. So Mufti Saab, once you came back to uh, England, your mother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her, uh, you decided obviously that you should stay. Um, so was w your, your institution, um, White Thread Institute, it's designed for post-graduation uh, courses. Was that uh, from all the things that you've learned? I mean, where, where did it start anyway? Was it yeah, no, did it start in America? Did it start no, here? no, White Thread Institute is very recent. It's 2017. It was a plan from before, but eventually mm -hmm. only came to fruition in 2017. Um, we had Zamzam Academy had started in America, but that's an online only, zamzamacademy.com. It's purely online. We've, we've never had a space for that. It actually started when I was in America. Uh, so I, as I said, I was two hours north of Los Angeles. Yes. There were these brothers, mashallah, uh, several brothers, Allah bless them. They used to come all the way from south of Los Angeles, Irvine, Tustin, Orange County, essentially. A good, good two and a half hour drive wow. on some Sundays to study. Wow. So they decided, we decided that let's record the classes that we are studying. And then we decided on a website, and it ca I can't remember who chose the name, it was Zamzam Academy, we just put it up there and uh, designed a logo and everything like that. So that's where it started. So I would say it's over, it's probably about 20 years old now. I would say it's probably about 20 years old now. And Allah bless those people who started the seeds Amen. of that. Amen. 
so that's purely online. You know, we have about a thousand lectures on there, so you can go there and you can listen to lectures. Thereafter that we started Rayyan Institute. You see, because our focus has always been, my focus has always been to find a gap in the market, if I use business terms, what others are not doing and that, are need, that is needed need and let's do that. Yes. It's very easy to just copy other people and which right. is fine. If you need to, that's fine. So what we decided was that for the general public, for them to go beyond lectures, you see, because lecture is to inspire you, is to encourage you. But generally most lectures don't give you any kind of solid knowledge. It's more encouragement and inspiration. So the next step needs to be some classes. Yes. And unfortunately, mostly what's available is an alim class or an alima class. But not everybody needs to be an alim or an alima or take that class. It's too advanced, right? So, mashallah, there's this, uh, you know, uh, some online institutes have started giving online classes, regular online classes, a bit of hadith, tafsir, and so on. So we started Rayyan Institute. Okay. So Rayyan Institute essentially is the next step from Zamzam Academy, where you go and you actually take classes. So you get a bit of aqidah, a bit of tafsir, a bit of hadith, a bit of history, a bit of aqidah, a bit of fiqh. You know, you can basically get more confidence. You can build, a, there's a lot of people, a lot of questions out there. Yes. So they keep asking questions. I generally say to them that yes, you can ask your questions, but why don't you just go and learn something solid, learn some fiqh so you've understood it from ground up. Mm. You'll feel a lot more confident. So alhamdulillah, there's a lot of people taking the courses on there, especially the Islamic essential certificate on there. Thereafter that, um, I, was, I became an imam in Stamford Hill Masjid. That was for about five and a half years. That was during when I was doing my master's and PhD. And then after that, I left that in 2014 or so. And was primarily working on White Thread Press now. Okay. So that White Thread Press is much older. That's probably about 18 years old. Probably older to be honest because it started off as... Because the first books that I wrote were... In Darulum, in oh, the fourth year. Wow. So I did the Fikul Imam and the Reflections of Pearls and the commentary of Zadu Talibin from the fourth year to the Bukhari year, in the last three years. That's where I did those books. So I'll, I'll just stop you there, Muftisal. Yeah. MashaAllah. There's, there's a lot of things that uh, even for me is news. Uh, inshallah, we will continue. Uh, we're going for a short break. So okay. requesting all our viewers, um, this is Hazrat Mufti Saab, inshallah, we will be discussing different, different topics. This segment was more about Hazrat Mufti Saab uh, and his background in education, his studies, where he studied. Inshallah, in the next segment, we will talk a little bit more about uh, A'mal uh, and how Ramadan was. Join us and more importantly, prepare your questions, inshallah, so that Mufti Saab can answer them. I'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Iqra Bangla uh, Islamic Q&A with Hazrat Alam, Hazrat Mufti Abdurrahman Mangera Sab. Uh, Hazrat Mufti Sab, we spoke a little bit about your background uh, and your studies and your um, uh, your travel and your journeys. Um, so we were on the postgraduate program that you started with. Um, so you're saying it started with Rayyan Institute first. Yeah, Rayyan Institute was, <coughs> as I said, it's just general public uh, courses. Um, and then after that, this was an idea. Actually, I think I remember in my last year, uh, year or two in America, I thought about this postgraduate program. But to do a postgraduate program, you need a, a huge number of ulama and alimats. Otherwise, yes. who's going to come there? Because yeah. not everybody's interested in that. Mm -hmm. So Alhamdulillah, I think in England it's good because in London alone, there's probably over a thousand alims and alimas, male and female graduates. What do they do after they finish? Yes. Some go to university, others are just teaching, maktab, whatever, but for continuous professional development, if they want to continue studying and increase their knowledge in hadith and tafsir and fiqh and so on, there wasn't much available. There may be a mufti course that they can go to somewhere else, but in London there wasn't one. So that's why Alhamdulillah we um, you know, consulted and then Alhamdulillah we started that off and Alhamdulillah it's been a success I okay. would say. May Allah okay. subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. Ameen. Hazrat Mufti Sab, we've got our first caller. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam brother. Um, I'd like to ask a question please um, to, yeah. the, to the Mufti. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, um, a few years ago, brother, well, before COVID started, I gave some money um, for a um, high deposit. And um, the money remained with the brother that I gave the money to, obviously. And, um, and then after a couple of years, I got some of most of it back. Um, whilst the money was with the, the, the brother I gave the money to, am I liable to place that card on that money? Uh, I'm not sure if my question makes any sense or not. That's fine, that's fine. I'll just repeat your question once again. So you spent some money for Hajj, uh, and then after a bit you uh, received most of it back. And now you want well, to know... You, you, yeah, basically the, the money that I gave as a deposit, that yeah. remained because we couldn't go because that's of That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but you received uh, it back? Yeah, I got the money back. Okay, and uh, now you want to so know... After, say, a couple of years. So within the, those two years, I did not have the money in my possession. Yes. Um, am I still liable? Do you have to, to pay the cut for those money? years? Okay, yes. that's the question. That's anything the else, question. brother? Do you want to know anything else? Uh, no, my mind's gone blank. I mean, I, I was just flicking through the channels and I saw um, our beloved Imam, so I thought I'll give a call because it's a question I wanted to ask. But I've got other questions, but nothing's coming to my head now. No problem, no problem. You take your time, inshallah. And inshallah, Mazat Mufti Sahib will answer your question. So, um, that's the question from okay, the brother. So, so, the question that I'm going to ask is that when you gave the money to them as a deposit, could you have taken it back or did you choose to leave it with them? Oh, that question has dropped. Because uh, okay. uh, it would depend on that, I think. Um, if you chose to leave it with them, it means that you could have taken it back, but you've chosen to leave it with them. So in that case, it's actually still your money. And since it's not being called for and you can take it back, then you yeah, will have to pay zakat on it. And if it's something that you couldn't have taken back because you'd committed to it and they, won't, they, won't, they weren't going to give it back to you because the deposit and they sometimes mm. don't give it back to you. Yes. Then in that case, that wasn't your money. And then mashallah, when you got it back, it, you can treat it as new income. And Allah okay. subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay. Okay, mashallah. Jazakallah. Uh, brother, I hope you got your answer. Uh, Azat Mufti Saab uh, has answered. So th it depends on whether you had access to that money while they were uh, holding on to it. Because I'm guessing it's because of COVID, the Hajj was blocked as well. Uh, and so if you had access to it and it was your choice to leave it with them, then yes, you have to pay zakat on the years. So that's the two years he has to pay zakat on both years. Okay. And if not, then it's new money. You can treat it like new money. Uh, and it's, there's no zakat on it. Jazakallah. Again, once again, I will uh, request all the viewers. I'm Darshakohol Tereami, invite Hormu, welcome Hormu. Afnar Zudi Kunu Prosno, English Tahe, Azat Mufti Sab, Amr Shatia, Soin Zarahan Afnara, Azat Mufti Abdul Muntakim Sab, Azat Mufti Abdul Rahman Sab, Amr Manar Pakir, Imam Sab Shate, Afnar Prosno Zikai, Afnar Zikai Tafarra, English Zikai Ben Shalla, Otoba, Afnar Zi Banglati Zikai Tasain, Zikauka, Amin Shalla, English Tandra Buzea, Prosno Tahormu, Inshallah, Atan Jawab Diba. Uh, Jazakallah, dear viewers, inshallah, Azat Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangela Sab is here with us and inshallah ready to answer your questions. If anybody has any questions, every Wednesdays, inshallah, from 9 o'clock all the way to 10.30, the Q&A, Islam Q&A, inshallah, we will be live. Uh, do, answer, uh, do ask your questions, inshallah, and Azat Mufti Sab will answer them. Coming back to you, Mufti Sab. So after um, uh, Rayyan Institute, uh, you were saying, you were explaining the... Yeah, so that's why in 2017, mashallah, we got a space, so we started the postgraduate course in there. And since, uh, I mean, I, I like to do things slowly and properly rather than trying to do too many things at once and then not being able to, you know, yeah, get a good job done. So then we started off with the Mufti course. So Alhamdulillah, it was actually quite popular even before we started that we got over 100 applications. But then eventually we had to cut them down. We only took about, I think, 14-15 uh, interviews and accepted about, I think, 11 people on the course or something, or so, 9 people, I can't remember now. Uh, but we're very strict because it needs to be done well. But what we realized in the process of that is that people, some people want to study fiqh, but they don't necessarily want to be a mufti. So then, see, we learned from that. That's not something that was being offered anywhere else as well. So we started the advanced fiqh <coughs> program as well, advanced jurisprudence program. Um, and then we started the advanced theology program because there was a lot of issues in terms of crisis in faith, uh, yes. various different under, uh, ideologies out there, confusions about what Islam says about certain things or why the Prophet did certain things and so on. So we started a theology program. And then we also 
the next year we started the advanced tafsir program. We don't like to call them, and other places they call them specialization. We don't like to call them specialization because you don't become a specialist in one or two years. You need mm -hmm. to spend many, many years on that. I think the only one we call a bit of a specialization program because that is what we're trying to focus on is the iftar program. So once the iftar program was done, alhamdulillah, then we started the fatwa center, which is essentially the modern Darul Iftar. It's a fatwa center. We've not promoted it. It's still on beta uh, because we still want to uh, populate Depending, it yeah. first and... Because we already get enough questions We don't need to promote it We yes. get so many questions that we can hardly deal with them So Alhamdulillah many of our graduates are now um, Actively responding, responding to On questions. the Fatwa Center Alhamdulillah um, Then what, the other thing that we did was that We established the menstrual matters So we've been for the last 10 years or so We've probably taught over a thousand women Alimas, mostly alimas uh, How to master The fiqh of menstruation because a lot of women, they ask these questions and they have to go to men, yes. yes. And it's sometimes it's very uncomfortable yes. and embarrassing sometimes as well for both parties. Yes. So I started off with my wife. She's an alima, but then taught her the whole mastery, uh, menstruation uh, fiqh. And alhamdulillah, since then we've taught, as I said, several hundred to a thousand. Mashallah. And there's so many of them are experts now in different countries in the world. Mashallah. And we've de developed this menstrualmatters.com website as well. On which women come and they ask their, it's dedicated to women questions on menstrual matters, hayd, nifas, istihada, answered by the women as well, alhamdulillah. Fantastic, mashallah. So, alhamdulillah. Mashallah. We have another caller, so we'll go to the caller, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Welcome to the show, brother. How are you? Uh, watching the show and the synchronicity is a little bit puzzling because I don't normally call in. Um, I have a question it's in regards to like a, a dietary choice and lifestyle based question. Okay. So am I okay to ask on air now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, anything, any questions you have, inshallah. Any questions you have. You can ask the question and then um, uh, if Mufti Sab, you stay on the line. As if Mufti Sab wants to uh, counter the question, maybe get a little bit of better idea in the question. So stay on the line, inshallah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, inshallah. So the question is that a lot of people now um, are opting in for like a vegan lifestyle. And some of these people are ideological and some of them it's just a dietary choice where they don't oppose any other diet or nutrition. So the question is, if somebody has taken an ideological stance in this and is against the slaughter of any animal and does not want to be included in a Qurbani program, for example, because inshallah soon there will be some... Yes. Um, Collections for these type of donations where people are obliged. Yes. Yeah. So um, they would, if they felt that they don't want to slaughter an animal through their physical hands or through their contribution, uh -huh. how would you manage that type of a donation or um, be saved in the terms of fulfilling that obligation? Yeah, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. How do you fulfill that obligation? Okay, that's your question. Yeah. That is my question. And okay. if I. If, if I'm still required to stay on the line, I will, otherwise I'll put the volume up and listen. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, stay there just one second. Mufti Sab, do you want to ask any further questions? Or? Did you understand the question? Yes, uh, yes. Can you just repeat the question for me? So he's saying people have a choice now. This veganism is a new um, idea where you don't slaughter animals. They don't want yeah. anything to do so with So what's animals. the last question? So last he's saying, how do, we, uh, how do we as Muslim, if a Muslim adopts this ideologically, yeah. wants to really dedicate to all yeah. this, how does he fulfill his fariza yeah, so, as so, a, so number one, I think it's a totally false ideology. Okay. Right? And I think it's actually against uh, our... I mean... Sorry, the, one second. Yeah. Sorry, before you answer, I think the brother's still online. Brother, um, yeah. so Mufti Sahib, you don't have any other questions, no, sir. No. So Jazakallah, yeah. you can, you can uh, cut off the line, inshallah. Can, uh, can I add one more thing? Can I yeah, add yeah. one more thing? Yeah, sure. Um, if a person is not obliged to eat meat by the dini ahkam, yeah. are they then um, can they find a solution regarding Qurbani? Okay. Okay, and that's all. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay good. So, <clears throat> you see, there's new trends in the world all the time. Yes. And obviously, there's going to be people who will pick that up because everybody listens and then, you know, if something appeals to you, you take that opinion. Yes. And that's the nature of the dunya and the world. And that's why we have a religion which kind of guides you. Now, the religion doesn't force us to eat meat, right? Uh, however, it's a sunnah to eat meat. But, I mean, I'll tell you that I'm a semi-vegetarian myself. 
in the sense that at home we only have meat, anything to do with meat. That means chicken. Some people say meat. Oh, so you eat chicken then, yeah. or fish? No, uh, chicken, red meat, or fish once or twice a week. Mm. Maximum three times. We're lucky, right? Okay. Maximum. We actually built it up to this because the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is not to eat too much meat. Yes. He ate basic stuff. A lot of the times, dates and water. Otherwise. Just a bit of barley or something like that. But when he got meat, he ate it. Yes. He had nothing averse to meat in the sense that don't eat meat. Yes, there are some narrations about uh, taking it easy on the meat uh, because meat has, a, um, you can say, an addiction, addiction. of some sort. <coughs> but for somebody to take an ideological stance, not because it's unhealthy for them particularly because they may have a medical condition of some sort and they've been told to avoid meat, but to just buy into this whole idea and do that, that's completely wrong, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's probably, is, it's probably, it is probably blameworthy as well. Uh, there's some hadith about that where somebody didn't want to eat a chicken because he said, I've seen chicken kind of wandering around and eating stuff, so I don't want to eat. So he, this is in the hadith, so he says, just eat, right? So it's not a good idea. Now, coming back to this issue, mashallah, at least uh, whoever this person is, they have a consciousness of trying to fulfill their qurbani as such, you know, their udhiyya. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative. The, it, it, you know, if, you, if a person who has the physical, uh, the monetary capability to do a qurbani and they didn't, then they would be sinful for having missed it because there's nothing else you can do. Exactly. Uh, if you miss the qurbani, because qurbani is a very specific uh, ruling. It's a very specific practice. Yeah. And that comes from emulating Ibrahim alayhi yes. salam. And if there's any fitra in the world, it's from Ibrahim alayhi yeah. salam. Fitra means the yeah. nature, the natural nature on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates human beings. That comes from Ibrahim alayhi salam. So there's a number of things that we need to do for our body and that we do in terms of removing uh, unwanted hair and, uh, you know, and a number of other things that we don't need to get into right now yes. they consider the fitra that, that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed the human being uh, to do uh, and, and to be with these things so Ibrahim alayhi salam was made to slaughter a ram and thus in emulation of that you know mashallah sunnah to abikum Ibrahim this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said that this sunnah of your father Ibrahim alayhi salam and then it's been the tradition and now mashallah we get you know, this idea, I mean, I know Hindus have had this for a while, but you know, I don't know where this crept into where Muslims are doing this. And I can, I can see they've got some arguments in terms of overabundance of animals and, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, animal factories, you could say, and the inhumane ways that animals are treated and so on. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, as such. Mm. It's a bit of a overkill on that. So... Um, that's why if somebody decided that they just want to pay instead, they wouldn't be able to do that. They have to slaughter. And then they're actually encouraged to eat from it. The Prophet ﷺ used to eat nothing before mm. the prayer mm. on Eid day, Eid al-Adha. On Eid al-Fitr he would eat something. You eat something and then but on Eid al-Adha he'd eat nothing. They'd pray, they'd pray, they'd slaughter an animal, and then the first thing that would hit his stomach would be the Meat. inner organs. Right, that because they, they cook much faster. Yes. Right, you know the uh, what you Kaleja, call it, the, the kaleji and, and the kidney yes. and, or right. whatever it is. Yeah. Mm. So that's what they used to do, and that's why, mashallah, some of our ulama like Sheikh Zakaria, Kandilwi mm. rahimahullah, on the day of Eid, because it's a sunnah to eat meat and it's like a hospitality from Allah subhanahu wa taala, he would actually eat just meat, just cooked meat, not even bread with it, not even roti with it. It's like this is. It's their way of, I mean, you wouldn't do this every day. Yes, of course. Right? Because people in UP at that time didn't eat that much meat. Mm. Right? But on that day he ate because this is hospitality from Allah. Hospitality. So, um, whoever's become a vegan ideologically, you really need to reconsider your position because I don't think it's sanctioned in Islam at all. Right? At all. Yes, minimize your meat intake. Absolutely. That could even be a sunnah. But... What I, what I suggest to people that if you want to eat meat, get good organic meat if you can. Eat a bit, but eat well. Yes. You don't have to get cheap meat every day and just, you know, Consume. basically abuse it. Yeah, yeah. But, but definitely, you know, don't, don't, don't give up on meat at all completely, you know. There's a lot of other non-religious non arguments against veganism anyway. 
right in terms of the proteins and what people need and so on and then you know the biggest one of the biggest issues is that you, nobody wants to eat meat but then you've got all of these burgers and sausages vegetarian ones that are being created for them so it's like like if you don't want to eat meat then you know just totally don't eat it that's just a bit of a joke <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the answer is, Mufti Sahib, uh, just summarizing, there is no alternative to Qurbani and Udhiyya. Udhiyya yeah. is wajib and uh, it, it needs to be done. There's no alternative whether you're vegan or you're not vegan. Uh, Islam comes first. Right, and you're yeah. not obliged to eat it. So if you don't want to eat yeah. it, you, don't have to you eat can it. give it yeah. out, all out. I mean, exactly. most of us actually do that we nowadays do, yes. when you give it out as Qurbani relief organizations in yes. other countries, you hardly exactly. see the meats. You know. Yes. Jazakallah brother for your question inshallah we are going to a small break again once again inshallah after the break we will continue you can ask any Islamic questions related to your religion related to Islam you can ask any questions inshallah Hazrat Mufti Sahib is here to answer your questions I'll see you after the break Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome back to Islamic Q&A with, live with Hazrat Mufti Abdurrahman Mangera Sahib. Assalamu alaikum Mufti Alaykum Sahib. Welcome back Mufti Sahib. Uh, Mufti Sahib, before we went to the break, Alhamdulillah, brother asked a question regarding veganism and mashallah, um, uh, the, the answer was uh, basically that, you, the, I mean, you, really the way I would look at it is Islam comes first. You're Muslim first and the wujub from Islam is that you do qurbani. Uh, your idea this is this is obviously it's, it's an idea like yeah. you said and it's not such a great one but anyway if if somebody does this then like Mufti Sab said uh, it is a good idea to maybe go down on uh, consuming meat and this can be regarded as sunnah as well that you reduce your meat intake but to totally disregard it uh, uh, is is uh, is not practical but while we're on this uh, subject of halal and uh, I was going to come to this anyway because um, uh, this is something that I heard from yourself mm -hmm. I believe and which is true that in America you had to travel was it two hours one way and two hours back or both yeah, but th going that, and coming th th that wouldn't be like everywhere in America obviously if you yes, live yes. in a city like Chicago in yes, Los Angeles yeah. itself mm -hmm. but from where I was yes in Santa Barbara there were no local halal meat stores at all wow. so we would actually have to go to Los Angeles to buy our meat so we'd go there maybe you know every two months or something and take a big cooler box and then just buy and then the other thing about meat was that because they were just so select places where it was properly halal because there's just so much meat industry wherever you go in the western world because haram meat is so much cheaper mm. there's just very few scrupulous people doing it well yeah. right it's, it's just very complicated and I don't say this in a pessimistic way or I don't say this in an overly critical way. It's the reality. And if you know the industry and if you know what goes on, it becomes very difficult for you because there's just so many problems because there's just so much money to be made and that's what people put first, unfortunately. Yes. So when I would go to Los Angeles, I would actually call a friend of mine there, Mufti Salim his name was, and he used to unofficially, because there was no certifying body at that time. Now I think there is a, at least a small certifying body. Yes. Well, there was one at that time, but I don't think it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right? There was one, but it wasn't everywhere. And now I think there's, there's a another hilal, one. Hilal committee, I think it was called. No, no, there's a hilal committee, but this is, I think now they've got called Hafsa, halal something, something. Yes, yes, Hafsa, that's right? right, yes. And then there was another one called Ifanka. I'm not sure how good or bad they were. I just can't remember the details anymore. But they weren't everywhere, okay? So it was all localized decisions. Okay. So you would go locally and if the ulama are there, that's what I would do. Yeah. Whenever the local ulama say, this is fine, I'll take their word exactly. and then I'll buy my stuff and I won't even ask the price. Yeah. You know, I'm generally, I try to budget when you buy something with yeah. the best price, but with halal meat, with you couldn't do that. You can't, yeah. It's just very select places. Yeah, yeah. So I would call Mufti and I said, where can I buy meat from? So he would tell me, okay, go to Jasmine on Sapalvida Boulevard. So I would go there and buy my meat. Uh, next time I'm in another area in Anaheim or in uh, Cerritos or whatever, so you'd say, okay, go to this area. So I bought my meat. Next time, after one or two months, I go back and I say, uh, Mufti Saab, I'm just in this area and I'm going to buy some meat, you know, where you told me last time. He said, no, 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 you can't buy from there anymore. I said, but you told me last time that they're okay. He said, no, I caught them mixing. No. What does mixing mean? So they would buy some from the proper halal and then they would buy others 
and um, the way he would find out is go and check their invoices. Now he have an idea of how much somebody's selling, and then the invoice for the halal would be just a bit, mm. you know, for the last two three months. Yeah. So, but there'd be more meat than that. So he'd find out, and then they'd sometimes even confess that yes, you know, we got it from this. Mm. Some of the suppliers would supply both proper halal and non halal. So it's very, very complicated. The other problem in America is that there's a lot of fatwas. A lot of fatwas. So in America, if you want proper halal meat, and you go to somebody's house or whatever, and you want a, or a function, and you can't ask, is it halal? Mm-hmm. Mostly it's all halal, they say. Yes. If it's from the supermarket, for them it's halal. They've got a fatwa or something. So if you want it properly hand-slaughtered, with bismillah, etc., you have to ask, is it the biha? Achha. If you don't ask Dhabiha, they'd say it's halal. I remember one program, I said, the brother's telling me, brother, this is halal, this is halal, this is Dhabiha, <laughs> this is halal. I was like, man, it's uh, confusing. It's That's why when I came back to the UK, and I saw HMC, and I learned about it, and you know, the red stickers, I was like, wow, what a relief. That you could go, and if you see the HMC sign, you could go and close your eyes and buy whatever you want. At least you're not responsible anymore. The HMC people are responsible, right? And I trust them. Yes, they've made mistakes because every organization makes mistakes, but it's still better than, alhamdulillah, having nothing. Believe me. Nothing, yes. And I think we should support them because, really, if you don't have any certifying body, it's going to be a lot more confusion. And the problem is that if you're going to eat something which is not halal or which is doubtful, then that affects you. You are what you eat. It's really important that halal foods, because your du'as aren't accepted, and a lot of other things. So don't take it easy on this, believe me. Don't mm. take it easy. There is just so much problem when it comes to halal. Yes. Right? Chalo, so that, was, um, that, is, that is something that is um, a, a huge aspect, especially for a Muslim. Um, and coming to, when it comes to, especially it comes to meat. I mean, fish is okay, chicken. Um, chicken is also is still a huge issue. But I think in America, what I found was interesting was um, I was visiting a relative and I saw the butcher shop at the back. They they have the live chicken and you can choose which chicken you want and the brother will yeah. slaughter it for you. Yeah, America is a big country, so in certain areas you would find that. So you can't, I mean, in America, you know, some places and each state has its own laws as well. Yes, yes. So, you know, we've been to farms to do qurbani ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just a lot more space and everything. So I guess, yeah, but I, I wouldn't say that you get that everywhere. No, you won't get that yeah. everywhere. Yeah, so I was, I was very intrigued because that was, that was, that was a relief because even, there's no, you don't need any kind of certification body now. Yeah, you you see can see it. yourself yeah. and there's no shak, there's nothing. That was amazing. Um, so that, that's uh, America for you. But Alhamdulillah, in England, we do have these facilities um, provided, Alhamdulillah, with the efforts of the ulama, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and it's a blessing. It's truly a blessing. Uh, just um, uh, as we near to the end of the program, um, while you're doing all of this, you're, you're traveling, you've, you've studied from different, different places, um, and then uh, now you have, um, uh, you have the um, White Thread Institute, you have the writing the books, the um, uh, press, White Thread Press. Uh, and now you're, you're a teacher, you're a she- uh, Ustad of Hadith uh, at uh, Forest Gate Imam Zakaria Academy. How, how do you manage all of that and why choose to uh, come to Imam Zakaria? Yeah, you know, Imam Zakaria Academy, um, I think it's just an absolute honor to be able to teach hadith, right? So when Mufti Sadr, I believe it was Mufti Sadr, uh, your uncle, yes. right? When he invited me, or is it Malna Anas, your father, I think, they invited me. It was an absolute honor, but the problem was that I was in Hackney. And you guys were in Forest Gate. And to travel every day 45 minutes, I was like, I can't do that. That's a big waste of time, you know, to do that. So that was the stumbling block, I guess. Mm. Um, but then, alhamdulillah, what, what, what we managed to do is to say that let's just consolidate the whole week of teaching in one day so that I get the whole... So that made life a lot easier, alhamdulillah, and I've never looked back. And it was an absolute honor. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't say no to teaching hadith. Subhanallah, you know, you just don't say no to teaching hadith. So I think it's an absolute honor, and I'm so grateful to uh, uh, Mufti Sab and uh, your your father Mona Anas for giving me that opportunity. Uh, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accept it. Amen, amen, right? amen. So our dear viewers, Alhamdulillah, um, 
we have had a, a great time with Hazrat Mufti Saab, inshallah, and your questions are all welcome. Uh, I do urge all the viewers uh, to spread the word every Wednesdays, uh, inshallah, you know, Hazrat Mufti Saab, you can see, is very, very busy. Uh, and from his schedule, you know, even Imam Zakaria was uh, actually, you know, uh, what's it called? But to have time to come here and answer your questions. Mufti Saab, we have just one more caller, inshallah. Last question, inshallah, and then we will finish. Mm -hmm. Salamu alaikum. Salam, brother. Make sure you're the first caller. Um, I, I listened to the answer and I thought I should call back again because I just wanted to clarify something to the book. Yes, yes, um, go ahead. If I'm allowed to do so, please, brother. Yeah, so basically, um, when I gave the money as a deposit, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's like, a, like a, a sign of commitment. It wasn't like um, once you give the deposit, it can just go and take it back again. Normally, it stays as a sign of commitment that you will, um, you will commit to the agreement. Yes. But what happened after a few months, obviously, we found out that we won't be able to go to Hajj that year. Yeah. So what I decided then, I had the option to either to take the money back then, or I, I, I decided to leave it to see if we were going to be able to go the following year. Uh -huh. So it was on that kind of basis the deposit was given. Um, so it wasn't like... Um, once you give the deposit, you can just go and take it back whatever you feel like. Um, that was really that's not how it normally works. You Does know, that no, that, that's yeah. So, so that's exactly why I said that in the f before the first Hajj was cancelled, you couldn't probably take it back, right? Because that was your commitment. However, um, because I I do go with different groups, uh, what they did was after the end of the first year, they expected that they would go next year. So they asked people, uh, when I spoke to different Hajj group owners, some said that we've told our customers, you can take your money back or you can keep it for next year mm -hmm. and you'd get priority. So there was an option. So because you've got an option, that money is no longer committed because let's just put it this way, if you had, if a person had an emergency, they would probably take the money back. That's their money. They consider that because it's not been spent yet and it's not committed. Yeah. If you are committed and said, no, we're not going to give it back to you, right? It's you've lost it. Basically, you come with us, otherwise you've lost it. Then that money is gone. Mm -hmm. But this way, the precaution here is that it's your money because you could have taken it back. And you, you could just refuse to go for Hajj. Right? So that, that's on the base. That's what I'm saying. So if, you're, if your travel agent was uh, refusing to give it back to you, as some may have been, right? Then you don't have to pay anything because you have no choice. But if Jazakallah. you can take it back, then it's your money. Jazakallah, brother. I hope that answers your question. Mufti Saab, uh, a huge Jazakallah to you for coming and joining this, uh, uh, sparing some time for us and joining. And uh, Inshallah, we will see, uh, we hope to see you for a very long time uh, in the future. Uh, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us this opportunity to take from Hazrat Mufti Saab. You've heard about his experiences, you've heard about his journey uh, uh, in studying and his education. And alhamdulillah, even now, currently serving the community, serving the ummah at a huge scale, mashallah, through writing, through uh, developing the scholars, and uh, through uh, teaching hadith as well, mashallah. Uh, so we welcome you all every Wednesdays, 9 o'clock to 10.30, quick Q&A with Hazrat Mufti Saab. Uh, uh, welcome inshallah uh, Today Jazakallah to Mufti Saab And Jazakallah to our callers, our viewers I hope you have all benefited inshallah Till next week Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh